Hi, my name is Patricia Sanford and I am director at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab. Welcome to Site Tour Saturday. Last week we toured the Kings Reach site, a tobacco plantation lived in by Richard Smith Jr., his family, and laborers between around 1690 to 1711. Today we're going to take a look at some of the over 66,000 artifacts that were recovered there at the site during the archaeological excavation in the 1980s. These artifacts were recovered from two primary types of archaeological context, the plow zone and from features. The plow zone is a thick layer of soil that has been turned over by the plow. At this site, over many hundreds of years, the property served as a farm after the buildings at Kings Reach had disappeared. These artifacts, having been churned about and hit by the plow numerous times, tend to be broken into small fragments. Artifacts were also recovered from features, places where humans dug holes into the ground for various purposes, to seat fence posts, to bury trash, as drainage ditches, for example. These holes, once filled with soil and artifacts, leave distinctive color changes that archaeologists can interpret and use to guide their digging. At the King's Reach site, many of the artifacts were found in the 13 below-ground pits or cellars that were dug beneath the floors of the two structures that once stood at the site. These pits became convenient places to dispose of household garbage. Since these features extended below the reach of the plow blade, these artifacts are usually larger and more complete. These are just a few of the many artifacts that were recovered by archaeologists at the King's Reach site. These artifacts include a bridle bit that let us know that the Smith family had horses. There was a nice padlock that was found in one of the subfloor pits in the main house that tells us, along with other archaeological evidence, that the pit had a wooden box that was locked. There was also a key found in another one of the subfloor pits. There were two really interesting musical instruments. Uh, the iron and copper alloy jaw harp, as well as this homemade whistle that had been crafted from a broken fragment of tobacco pipe with the, see the little notch that has been um, cut into it. There are personal items like decorative buckles, sewing scissors, and then a bone and pewter needle case, and a tobacco pipe. Evidence of the family's uh, eating and drinking habits were present in um, ceramics, like this really nice German stoneware jug base that was found. Uh, another jug of brown stoneware that probably held things like ale. Uh, this blue and white piece here is tin glazed earthenware with a, a nice uh, chinoiserie or Chinese style design on it that was probably part of a large plate or charger. Archaeologists very rarely find things that are complete, but in the bottom of one of the subfloor pits was this really wonderful uh, wine bottle. And then we had lots of evidence of the tools that the family used around the plantation. Uh, this very well used chisel as well as a scythe that would have been used for cutting uh, wheat and other types of grain. The artifacts found in the lower levels of the cellars, plus the placement, size, and depths of the pits, tell us how they were used initially. The garbage tossed into them once they stopped functioning as a cellar reveals other aspects about the lives of the people who lived at King's Reach. Some of the subfloor pits were dug in spaces between floor joists and entered through wooden trap doors cut through the floor. The main house had a five by seven foot projection off of its north end. Inside this small room, a pit had been cut through the floor. This room has been interpreted as a dairy, a place to make and store milk, butter, and cheese. Digging a pit into the floor below the room would create a cooler place to store these perishable foods. The pit was lined with a wooden box to keep the food contamination free and to prevent rodents from coming in to eat the food. Pits located in front of fireplaces were usually larger and deeper than cellars located in other parts of the building. They were generally used to store foods that needed to be kept warm and dry from the radiant heat of the hearth, foods like sweet potatoes or grains. Analysis of soil layers found on the floors of these Hearth front pits often show pollen and other plant remains that provide archaeologists with clues as to the food stored there. 
The hearthfront cellar at the King's Reach site contained layers of ashes from the fires that would have needed to burn year-round for food preparation. The pit also contained dozens of brass straight pins, suggesting that the inhabitants did a lot of sewing around the heat and light of the fire. Several pits in the shed addition that were smaller and much more shallow than those in the main part of the house. These are believed to have been personal storage pits, possibly for indentured laborers or enslaved individuals who may have been sleeping in this unheated area. There were very few artifacts from these pits. One of the smaller pits located near the hearth contained a very large and folded fragment of copper mesh screen. Archaeologists don't know what this screen was used for, but it is possible that it might have been used to sift grains. Archaeologists believe indentured servants or enslaved people of African descent also lived in the smaller, separate building at the site. There were two cellar pits in the smaller building, and comparing the animal bone, which were food remains, from the main house in the quarter show clear differences. Most of the meat diet for both the owner and laborers were from domesticated animals like cow, pig, and chicken. But a lot of wild game was present as well. Deer, quail, rabbit, dove, and duck. The marine life so prevalent in Southern Maryland was also present in great quantities. Fishbone, oyster shell, turtle shell, and crab shell. In the main house, there were a greater variety of animal species present in the diet, as well as larger quantities of bone and better cuts of meat. There was also a greater variety of small game present for the Smith family diet. Documentary evidence suggests that the Smith family left the King's Reach site around 1711 when they built a new home down at Peterson's Point, that's the Smith St. Leonard site, which has been the focus of three previous Site Tour Saturday videos. We hope that you will watch them if you haven't already. It is believed that indentured laborers or enslaved people of African descent continue to live in the buildings at the King's Reach site for a number of years after the Smith family left. The King's Reach site has a lot to tell us about the history of people living in the Chesapeake in the late 17th century, and the site and its artifacts still have many more stories left to tell. We hope that you'll join us next Saturday for another Site Tour Saturday. We are going to be looking at the Stern site, a prehistoric site located here on Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum.